Make sure the world travels with you. Check in, log on, and get connected with all of the latest developments at your fingertips. CNN Partner Hotels, connected to your world. surprise me at all that they would they would delight in this but the important thing to ask oneself is what is al-qaeda today uh it really is a, a, a shadow of the organization that it was in in uh, 2001 not just militarily because it's been on the run and it's been it's been destroyed the, the much larger issue is that al-qaeda sought to represent the hopes and aspirations of millions of, of muslims uh, particularly in the greater middle east that, that's, no longer, it, it, that's no longer true if it ever was, because the big revelation of the last 20 years, Wolf, is, is not the war between the West and Islam, but the war within Islam, between the moderates and the, and the fundamentalists, the militants. And I think it's pretty clear the moderates have won. Look at Saudi Arabia, which 20 years ago was playing footsie with terrorists, funding Islamic uh, fundamentalism and religious conservatism all over the world. Saudi Arabia is now at the forefront of, uh, of efforts to modernize, liberalize, open up uh, the country. You look everywhere around the world and the, the fundamentalists are on the defensive. So I feel like, of course, whatever is left of Al-Qaeda is going to be delighted. But they have a much bigger problem, which is that most of the Muslim world has very decisively turned their backs on Al-Qaeda and its ilk. That's really critical. Uh, the president, President Biden, acknowledged today that the United States has to learn from its foreign policy mistakes. How do you think uh, history, Farid, is going to judge President Biden for his role in this war and the way it ended? It's a big question, and I think that, uh, you know, as, as Sir Graham said, we journalists, we write the first draft of history, but we don't get to write the, the final version. My sense is this. He, call, he, he pulled the curtain from uh, behind a, uh, a, a mission that had failed. Uh, let's think about it this way, Wolf. We spent $2 trillion 20 years. We did a, a surge where troops went up to 130,000. And the government and the army we stood up could not, could not withstand seven days of, of, of a Taliban advance. In fact, it had been slowly capitulating over the last year. That should, be, that should be the biggest wake-up call that we need to hear, which is, what were we being told for 20 years? What were we being told in 2014 and 15, after the surge, when the Taliban was gaining ground? You know, we had been unable after 10 years, after a surge, nothing had worked. And yet we convinced ourselves that somehow this was sustainable. And remember, we were sustaining this at $50 billion a year, plus massive numbers of Afghan casualties. So I think that Biden really forced us to look at that failure in a way that is commendable. The exit itself does strike me as very poorly planned and it could have been executed better, particularly in the first phase. But, you know, that's frankly the, the larger story 
is the extraordinary failure of, of the last 20 years and the deception. But think about all the generals and all the experts and all the cabinet officers who were convincing themselves and the American people that this was something that was working. They were inventing metrics by like the Afghan army, which by the end we were told was 350,000 and the best train ever. Those are the words of one of the commanding generals. That's the big failure. And I think Biden, in a sense, uh, shot a spotlight on it. Nobody wants to see failure, but it was there. And the Afghan army melted away within a matter of a few days. Fareed, thank you very, very much as always. Coming up, a, a very disturbing surge of COVID cases among children here in the United States. We're going to talk about it with our Dr. Sanjay Gupta when we come back. Classroom of second graders. Our definitely excited. A president and a movement that forever unites them. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center. Now, 20 years later, there was only 16 of us with him. We get to be the people that tell the story. Do you think that that day affected who you are today? The CNN special report from Rhode Street, the 9 11 classroom, on Monday on CNN. Protospects. By the way, prospects means professional specification, which is appropriate because this watch has its origins in the 1965 expedition to Antarctica by a Japanese crew. Seiko was the giant of Japanese watchmaking at the time, so it got the job of making a watch that could endure the harsh conditions of Antarctica. This is a watch you can wear up to 1,000 feet underwater. It almost reminds me of a Japanese samurai warrior with all those different layers of metal and wood over them. It can take a beating and it can respond. So if you're looking for something that has that robustness, that strength, but at the same time you just want something that looks really striking, will grab people's attention, this is a great watch. Big companies selling you your smartphones and electric vehicles are worth trillions of dollars. All those devices and cars have cobalt in them. But the people digging that cobalt out of the ground earn a dollar or two a day. That's an injustice, that is modern slavery, and that cannot stand. My name is Siddharth Kara. I'm a British Academy Global Professor and an adjunct lecturer at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. For the last few years, I've been traveling to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and I've been researching uh, cobalt mining. What I've seen in the Congo is hell on earth. There are children caked in grime and filth, digging in pits and tunnels to excavate cobalt-containing ore, and that, that ore gets processed and refined and sent up into the formal supply chain to smartphone makers and EV manufacturers around the world. I think the most important thing young people can do is to be aware of the fact that the children in the Congo scraping and scrounging for cobalt uh, are directly touching their lives every day. And I think knowing that and spreading awareness of that is the most important first step. And awareness will lead to action. learned a lot over this past year, and uh, what I will say right away is that many of the predictions that were made earlier in the pandemic are proving not to be reliable, and I think that's not surprising because trying to predict the future in the middle of a crisis is um, a tough thing to do. I think the prediction about the decline or death of business travel and large group convenings uh, was very, very greatly exaggerated. So. What we're seeing is corporations who are keen to get their own people back together. So we've got a lot of cool corporations coming to us for uh, the end of this year, uh, trying to put uh, meetings together so that they can reconvene their own people. On the leisure side, uh, people are desperate to get out, so that drive to human connection has never been stronger. Tonight, very 
Secretary is serving new evidence that COVID-19 infections among children here in the United States are on the rise with more than 200,000 cases just last week. Now let's discuss with our chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, good to have him here with us in the situation. Yeah, good to be here. Sanjay, thanks uh, very much for doing this. Uh, this is, these numbers are pretty serious, uh, pretty awful. I'm very worried about these kids. Yeah, 200,000 cases diagnosed last week. That's a significant increase from the week before. You know, school's about to start. You know, we, we think about the fact that it, the likelihood of severe disease is obviously much lower in kids, but it's not zero. When you start to get denominators this high, you're gonna get more and more kids getting sick. Just to give you context, well, about 450 children have died of COVID. That's two to three times worse than the worst flu season we've had over the last you know, 20 years or so. So this is significant. Obviously, they can transmit if they have unvaccinated parents in the home or other people. That's a concern. And then the concern about the, the long-term symptoms in these kids. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of concern about this and some strategies as well. There's some modeling. I just want to show you this. The predictions are now, well, that after school starts, it has started in some places already, about 75% of children will be exposed to the virus within the first three months of school. Now, if you, if you put in masking, if you have universal masking, 24 to 50%. So it does make a significant reduction. You add in testing as well, it can go as low as 13%. There's no question it's a contagious virus. Kids will become infected. But look at that. Well, even without vaccines, that can make a huge difference. Yeah, and a lot of parents are still reluctant to give their kids who are 12 to 17 the vaccine. I, I am I am not reluctant. You know, you've got kids between I, the ages of 12. And I have three that fall right into that age group, and you know, I've looked at the data. I've done the homework. I'm a parent first. I'm a dad first, and my kids all got vaccinated. I mean, it's it's yes, it's true again that the risk of severe disease is lower, much lower in kids. But you know, when Dr. Gottlieb and others say this, this could be the worst viral illness they suffer in their lifetime, and it can be prevented. I mean, they have the option to do that. Because what also worries me is that even if they're not going to go into a hospital or, God forbid, die, there could be long-term effects for these kids. I hear these stories about kids, uh, you know, taking these you know, several-hour COVID naps during the day, developing brain fog, losing their sense of smell. These are significant problems. Uh, they could be an indication of something more significant going on that's going to be long-term in the brain. You don't, you don't want this virus, and, and there's ways to avoid it. What about a, a vaccine for the kids under 12, the 5 to 11-year-olds? A lot of parents are anxious to see that happen. I know, and, and you know, you, you wish that it could be quick. Uh, I think the FDA is taking time on this, and to be fair, Pfizer hasn't even submitted all the data yet, so the FDA really can't be sort of blamed for not moving fast enough if the data hasn't been submitted. What they've asked for is longer-term safety data. They want six months' worth of safety data. You remember it was two months for adults back last year. They want a lot more for kids. They also doubled the, the uh, enrollment size in the trials. So if you, if you look at it all, put it together, September, October, sort of time frame before that data is submitted, and a couple weeks after that, you could have an authorization. Oh, Jim, we're great to have you uh, on, on the show, but especially good to have you here in Washington in this situation. Thanks for, for all the great work you do. We're, we're, we're so appreciative. All right, we'll have more news right after this. For World Sport. World Sport. For World Sport, I'm Blue White. I'm Amanda Davis. I'm Andy Jones. I'm John Rennell. I'm Alex Thomas. I'm Patrick Snell. And this, this, this is CNN.
and this is CNN. with CNN for breaking news uh, coverage on the hurricane disaster in Louisiana. And if you're looking for information on how you can help hurricane victims and Afghan refugees, go to CNN.com slash impact for details on ways to impact your world. Thanks very much for watching. I'm Will Flitzer in the Situation Room. You can always follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Will Flitzer. Tweet the show at CNN Sit Room. Aaron Burnett on front starts right now. A run act we will hunt you down. Those are the words from President Biden as he vows to take on any terrorist who threatens the United States. Now that the Afghanistan war is officially over. Plus the growing misery in Louisiana tonight. People in the state desperate for food and water, and it could be weeks before power is restored. And the Republican lawmaker warning of bloodshed as he's pushing false and dangerous claims about America's elections. Let's go out front. And good evening, I'm Mary Burnett. Out front tonight, President Biden with a message for ISIS. America is not done with you yet. President Biden vowing to maintain America's fight against terror, even as he forcefully defended his decision to end the war in Afghanistan. Let me say clearly, to those who wish America harm, to those who engage in terrorism against us or our allies, know this, the United States will never rest. We will not forgive, we will not forget. We'll hunt you down to the ends of the earth and we will, you will pay the ultimate price. President on defense, those forceful words, because he is on defense, he's saying he will now go after terror where it is today. He explicitly says that terror is not where it was two decades ago when Al-Qaeda, of course, launched the 9-11 attacks from Afghanistan. The war in Afghanistan is now over. I'm the fourth president who has faced the issue of whether and when to end this war. When I was running for president, I made a commitment to the American people that I would end this war. Today, I've honored that commitment. Biden says the war should have ended long ago. Of course, this is a war that spanned 20 years, America's longest, consumed four presidencies, cost more than $2 trillion, and took the lives of 2,461 American personnel, including 13 Americans, of course, that died last week. Cost that researchers at Brown University estimated would be over 
hundred million dollars a day for 20 years in Afghanistan for two decades. What have we lost as a consequence in terms of opportunity? I refuse to continue in a war that was no longer in the service of the vital national interest of our people. Well, these are the images we're now seeing now that the war is over. Taliban fighters wearing what appear to be American military uniforms in Afghanistan, conducting a full sweep of a hangar that had been used by U.S. troops. That's part of why the president's under such incredible criticism. He is pushing back against critics who explicitly have said the United States should have kept a small force in Afghanistan. People saying, right, 2,500 troops, it's worth the money. He says no. There's nothing low risk or low grade about any war. Again, citing the loss of the Americans who lost their lives and also the mental toll that the war has taken on veterans. We see in the shocking and stunning statistic that should give pause to anyone who thinks the war can never be low grade, low risk, or low cost. 18 veterans on average who die by suicide every single day. a foreign place, right here in America. There's nothing low grade or low risk or low cost about any war. It's time to end the war in Afghanistan. Biden's Department of Defense. His decision to end the war in Afghanistan comes as defense officials tell CNN that the military made a secret deal with the Taliban, one that resulted in militants actually escorting Americans to the gates Thank you.